The attractive woman is my wife, Anne Bradley, one of Broadway's finest actresses and one of the world's nicest people. The man is yours truly, Mark Bradley. I won't flatter myself except to say that my wife loves me. In the theater, we are rated pretty high in the category of husband and wife acting teams. I may also look familiar to those of you who have seen the television show called Life with Father. In private life, we are known and sometimes sympathized with as the parents of Maggie. You see us now on the patio of our new home in the quiet, old-fashioned little town of Hunter's Ferry, Connecticut, where we are busy making friends with our new neighbors. I'll be sorry when she gets that wall built. Those looks she gives us lowers the temperature at least 12 degrees. Mark, dear, do you think we've made a mistake moving here? Don't be silly, darling. It'll just take a little time, and it's going to be great for Maggie. Oh, I'm sure it is. So far, she's bored to death. She's having trouble finding trouble to get into. Just give her a little time. Give who a little time? Amelia Earhart. She'll turn up. <laughs> One of your father's little jokes, dear. There's Miss Caldwell. What a poor, lonely, tragic figure she is. Easy, Maggie. I bet she had a very unhappy love affair when she was young. And she fell in love with a handsome Mississippi river gambler and gave her innocent heart. And she was happier than she'd ever been. And then one night, she came home and found him in the arms of another woman. And as she stood there, struck dumb, the handsome brood laughed at her. Laughed right in her dumbstruck face. <laughs> at that moment, something in her died. Something beautiful. You through? <laughs> if we could bottle Maggie's imagination, we could wipe out the entire liquor industry. There's nothing wrong with Maggie's imagination. That must be the ball. Now, oh, Maggie, why don't you uh, go and uh, uh, oh, finish unpacking the trunk, the big one? Okay, Daddy. When you want me out of the way, I wish you'd find better ways to do it. <laughs> Poor kid. I hated to do it, but remember the last interview? Yes, I know, darling. Well, well hello. Miss Colton, so you? nice to see you. Mr. Baldwin, Bradley, uh, sit down. Miss Colton, Mr. Baldwin. Thank you. Make yourself comfortable. Excuse me, dear. Well, now, what can we tell the readers of uh, Hunter's Fairy Times? How do we like Connecticut? We love it. Oh, here's some lemonade, Miss Colton. No, thank you. Uh, Mr. Baldwin. Thanks, no. I suppose you know you've moved into a very old-fashioned town, Mr. Bradley. There are people in Hunter's Ferry who feel about actors the way George felt about General Sherman. Take your neighbor, for example. Oh, well, you know, I think that Miss Caldwell and her friends are going to be surprised. They'll find that we never give wild parties and seldom filled our pool with champagne. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, Mark and I go on for days on end without a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> well, the story is the Bradley family is respectably human. The two-thirds we know of, that is. How about your daughter? Is it true that the other members in the cast of your last play offered to take a 50% pay cut if the producer would agree to bar Maggie from the theater? <laughs> oh, they were only kidding, some of them. There's nothing wrong with Maggie. Sorry, I didn't mean to probe a tender spot. It's no tender spot. Maggie just happens to be a normal, healthy 17-year-old. I claim this patio for Frost. <laughs> you are all prisoners of Joan of Arc, Maggie. This, I take it, is your daughter? Never saw the kid before in my life. Who is it? Mother, look what I found in the big trunk. There was a letter with it from Ingwood Bergman. Not now, darling. This is Mr. Baldwin and Miss Colton. They've come to interview us for the newspaper. Oh, the press. <laughs> we do so enjoy these opportunities to talk to you people of the newspaper world. As I was saying to Anne the other day, that's Mumsy, we call her Anne. The newspapers are actually the only way that we of the theater have of making... Oh. <laughs> of making contact with the world outside and of showing people that just because we're so terribly glamorous doesn't mean we aren't human beings under the grease paint. Thank you, Tallulah. I would like a word with you in private. Oh, all right, dear. You will excuse us, won't you? <laughs> now, just what do you think you are up to? 
Father, that's the way they expect us to act. We owe it to our public. Maggie. Maggie, your mother and I are very anxious for the people of this town to know us for exactly what we are, normal human beings. Oh, honestly, Father, for all you and Mother know about glamour, you might as well be a man and wife team of plumbers or something. Plumbers don't bring... <laughs> plumbers don't bring their plungers into the living room. And we leave our acting in the theater. Now, I want you to go back out there and behave as an ordinary 17-year-old girl. Come on. Never crowd your exit. <laughs> now, where were we? We were talking to Miss Bradley. She was saying some very interesting things about the theater. The theater? Me? Oh, goodness, what does an ordinary 17-year-old like me know about the theater? I don't suppose you have any bubble gum, do you? No, I suppose not. <laughs> but we 17-year-olds giggle a lot, you know. We giggle and chew gum and dance rock and roll. Oh, couldn't you just swoon? Just me the most. Your interview is over now, Maggie. Thank you very much. You may leave now. Oh, goodbye, Mr. Baldwin, Miss Coney. It was so nice meeting you. <laughs> oh, I told you we giggle a lot. Oh, and don't forget to call us up when your drains get stopped up. <laughs> Quite a sense of humor, our Maggie. Will you excuse me for just a moment, please? What did she mean, uh, when our drains get stopped up? Who knows? I've given up trying to understand this bop talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, Margaret, darling, that really wasn't very nice, the way you just acted. Oh, I'm sorry, Mother. I don't know what's the matter with me. I feel so maladjusted. <laughs> Maybe I'm sick or something. Oh, darling, you're not sick. You've just been pulled up by the roots and plunked down into strange territory. It would be very strange if you didn't feel the way you do. And I tell you what, why don't you wash your face and go over and talk to that young man next door you were telling me about, huh? Oh, you mean weird, Willie. Thank you, darling. And that isn't nice about Willie. Oh, you don't know Willie. There wasn't such a word as weird. You couldn't describe him. <laughs> oh, Willie. Well, I guess he's not here. <laughs> Hello, Willie. Maggie, I'm, I'm very busy. I just want to stay here. I haven't been feeling too well today. Oh, really? I'm suffering from ennui. That's French. It means boredom. <laughs> Parlez-vous français, mon cher ami? Mais certainement. Je l'ai étudié quatre ans à l'université et j'avais un ami de Paris qui insistait toujours que nous conversions seulement en français. Vous parlez bien? Oh, all right, Willie. Force to be a bad neighbor. Refuse the hand of friendship. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have nothing but bad luck from this moment on. You're leaving now? Yes. I only hope the luck keeps up this bad, and goodbye, Tovarich. No. I don't see what harm it would do if I just went over and said hello to Miss Caldwell. Yeah, do that, please. After all, you have to love thy neighbor. And if one neighbor turns out to be a creep, you try another. <laughs> You're lagging again. Time I stand still in the motor stalls. <laughs> oh, I'm just tired, that's all. Good morning, Miss Caldwell. I don't believe I know you, young man. I'm not a young man. I'm a young lady. My name is Margaret Bradley. I'm very sorry to disagree with you, but that's impossible. Young ladies do not wear trousers. Now, what can I do for you, sir? Oh, nowadays, all girls wear slacks. But I suppose you have every right not to approve. It's a free country. The rest of the country may be free, but Hunter's Ferry has not yet escaped from the restrictions of dignity and good taste. I suppose you're right about that. And don't insult my intelligence by pretending to agree with me. Now, if you'll excuse me. 
Young man. Miss Caldwell, I'm warning you. You can't love thy neighbor if thy neighbor keeps getting thy goat. <laughs> well, it's your own fault. Should have known those handsome Mississippi River gamblers are all alike. <laughs> I want them to put more men on that wall. <laughs> A night shift. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Nothing. Oh, boy, that Miss Caldwell sure is an old crab. That goes to show what happens when you grow old without love, Hester. <laughs> Don't let that happen to you. Don't you worry. The very first fella that asked me to marry him, I'm going to close my eyes and say yes. How are you going to close your eyes? Well, I know he'll be odd looking, and I wouldn't want the sight of him to change my mind. <laughs> Tell me something. Mm. Who's that cute old man helping Miss Caldwell cut roses? It's Whitaker. He's been with her for 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> you know, I bet he's crazy about her. Secretly, of course. <laughs> Imagine, Hester. I bet she loves him, too. For 20 years, they've been torturing themselves with the nearness of each other. Talking about roses and ordinary things. When all the time they're dying to fall into each other's arms. <laughs> longing to hold each other and kiss away the tears. Tender words of love. Put down that box and grab her, you fool! <laughs> And she won't. Pride. <laughs> Foolish pride. Each is afraid to be the first to speak. Now I understand Miss Caldwell. That's why she's so crabby. Hester, what a wonderful thing for someone to bring those two together. You know, I'm not going to stand by and see two people ruin their lives. <laughs> Maggie, remember what your mother said. Hester, dear. Where would we all be today if Joan of Arc had listened to her mother? My duty to humanity comes first. Well, your hats. Here we go again. Also in my heart. Sherry, Miss Caldwell, because I just quit. Well, I should think so. Yes. No, I, I'll put up with, with uh, coming in Sundays and, and cutting roses and doing dishes on the maid's day off. But by Christopher, I draw the line at, 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 at hacky packy. Hacky packy? What are you saying? I'm saying that a horse that's being put out to pasture should be left in peace. So if you've got any ideas of hitching me up to your wagon, well, I just got to find me another pasture, that's all. Mind. And I might also point out that you're a fool to try and uh, uh, get another trip out of that wagon of yours. Billy Doo. Better luck with the next fellow. <laughs> just a moment. I didn't write this. Oh, just a second there. Don't tell and me. Suddenly, I feel sure 
that you didn't write this. Let me see that. Monsieur. Come on, Monsieur. Uh, my heart is your slave. <laughs> of course I didn't write that. Where did you get that, Miss Caldwell? Uh, right here beside me. Where was yours? You're over there on the desk. Miss Caldwell. Now, if you'll just give me a chance to... No, I don't know how it feels to be ridden out of town on a rail. And I... <laughs> Miss Caldwell, I think you're making a mountain out of it. Now, Miss Caldwell, if you'll just give me a chance... Hello? Hello? What happened? You can't spank a 17-year-old girl. Why not? Hey, Mark, what is it? What's Maggie done? You could get someone to hold her. Do you think you could hold her? What? No, she's stronger than you. Mark, will you please back up? You've just lost a passenger. I've got it. Remember how that wicked stepmother got rid of Hansel and Gretel? We'll take her out in the woods and we'll... No, we don't want to lose her. Just, uh, torture her. Mark, please, will you just... Now, we'll think of something. Let me see. Trouble is, they don't understand me. They don't want to understand me. They're against me. Sometimes I feel as though the whole world were against me. Sometimes I feel as though you're crazy. <laughs> you're fine. Want to buy a banana? <laughs> Get some sleep, Maggie. Regina Carstairs would know how to handle them. Regina Car who? Regina Carstairs. She's the heroine of the book I'm writing. Regina Carstairs is the most wonderful woman in the world. What does she do? Well, she's a Hollywood movie star. But on the side, she does some detective work for the police and some international spying for the government. She's a graduate of medical school and law school. But mainly, she goes around fighting for the underprivileged. It's documentary star. Would you like to read it? I'll wait for the movie. You're fired. Sure. <laughs> Good night, Meg. <laughs> and hush fell over the small country courtroom of Hunter's Ferry, Connecticut. As Mark Bradley squirmed in the witness chair under the cold eyes of Regina Carr. Steel. The cold eyes of Regina Carstairs. Counsel for the... Gorgeous counsel for the defense. Then you admit you do not understand your daughter. No, no, I don't admit it. I... Did you forgive her? Well, I... Answer the I... question, yes or no. No. Are you aware of the Supreme Court ruling that to understand is to forgive? Yes. And did you forgive? No. Speak up, please. No. Then, ipso facto, your honor, and e pluribus unum, I submit that the witness has admitted lack of understanding of his daughter. Brilliant strategy, Miss Carstairs. <laughs> Woman Regina Carstairs, you are a she devil. Never crowd your exit. I object to defense counsel's dress. Oh, I apologize to the court, but I rushed here from the Academy Award dinner and barely had time to put my Oscar on the mantel. Let alone change clothes. <laughs> Objection overruled. Incidentally, Miss Carstairs, you were wonderful in that part. La plume de mon oncle is sur la table. That's French for, buddy, you're in big trouble. Call your next witness, prosecutor. Miss Caldwell. Are you going to 
handle her. She's a tough witness. Watch. Will you stand up, please? I object. What is counsel trying to prove? Only this. Washington and tell him Regina says, come and get Slippery Stanley Maxwell. Amazing. How did you know? Elementary. I got suspicious when I found a cigar butt with lipstick on it in the ladies' washroom. <laughs> Great woman. It's 10 o'clock, Babykins. Lights out. Babykins. Next time I get you on the witness stand, you won't get off so easy. Sure. <laughs> Good night. Good morning, darling. Oh, Mother, is Dad feeling any better? No, Maggie, and neither am I. Miss Caldwell, Joe seems determined to make trouble for us. Your father's seeing a lawyer now, though. He's trying to change your mind about pressing charges against you. Sometimes I wonder if I'm a girl or a she-devil. <laughs> oh, nothing, Mother. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. I hope so, sweetie. to tell you to stop worrying about me because I won't be here after today. You're moving out? Oh, that's wonderful news. Not me, Dad. Just me. Just you? I'm running away from home. <laughs> You're doing no such thing. I can't seem to stay out of trouble. I'm just no good to anybody. The only decent thing to do is disappear. You're talking nonsense and you know it. Have you been crying? No, Miss Caldwell. Can you write to Mummy and Daddy? They're going to miss me terribly. And, and now, just a moment, young lady. You come around through the gate so we can talk this matter over. Bill? All right. what you said to her that made her drop the charges. Not only drop the charges, but call up and invite your mother and me over this evening. <laughs> I figured she was really a kind-hearted woman, so I worked on her sympathy. I told her I was running away from home. Oh, Maggie, that was terrible. <laughs> only half terrible, because I have men in it. What did Miss Caldwell say? Well, she said that I really can't be blamed for the things I do. She says, as the twig is bent, so the tree will grow. Meaning? Uh, you're bending me wrong. <laughs> she says that it's a shame to make a sweet child like me do the things I do. She says that you can't be very good parents. And that she's going to come over and give you a piece of her mind that you'll never forget. from tonight, Johnson's Wax brings you Poor Mrs. Campbell, starring Agnes Moorhead and Edward Andrews. This is Art Gilmore speaking.